HR Club Talks, podcastul celei mai mari comunități de profesioniști în resurse umane din România. Powered by WizRom. Salutare, sunt Madalina Tănase și mă bucur să vă regăsesc la un nou episod de HR Club Talks. Partenerul acestui episod este WizRom, soluțiile WizRom pentru managementul resurselor umane dezvoltate în colaborare cu cei peste 1000 de parteneri, transformă experiențele de HR pentru lumea muncii de mâine cu scopul de a digitaliza complet procesele de HR și de a eficientiza modul în care lucrează aceste departamente. Invitata specială a acestui episod împărtășește cu noi povestea ei personală ce are un mesaj extrem de puternic și de impact. Ce schimbări a făcut în viață pentru a-și îmbunătăți starea fizică și mentală după ce a fost diagnosticată cu cancer, cum a depășit șocul și depresia, cum are grijă de a în prezent și cum a transpus toate lecțiile învățate din propria experiență la locul de muncă. Silie Loken, Head of Wellbeing Technip FMC, a vorbit despre rolul departamentului de wellbeing în organizația în care activează și cum a construit și monitorizat planul de well-being pentru angajații companiei, trecând de la o structură ierarhică la una bazată pe crearea unei rețele de lideri răspunzători de mediul de lucru în fiecare filială a companiei. Acest episod va fi în limba engleză, așadar, switch to English. Hello everybody and welcome to a special episode of HR Club Talks. Today we'll have a conversation that fits very well with the holiday season. I have here two special guests. Mihaila Ionita, a dear member of the HR Club community and a senior expert in the field of human resources. Our conversation partner is Celia Loken, Head of Wellbeing, Technip, FMC. Celia is a living example that any obstacle can be overcome when challenged in life. Thank you very much for joining us and I'm glad to have this talk at this time of the year, a time of reflection, celebration and gratitude to dear people. Ladies, the stage is yours. Thank you, Madalina, and uh, happy to record this uh, podcast together and to welcome uh, Celia, whom I met uh, a couple of months ago during our uh, HR Club uh, conference and um, actually her life story was uh, really touching and um, really inspired me. She will talk with us about uh, the duty we have towards ourselves to care for and love ourselves first, to be able to take care for the others. And actually your story, Celia, your fight with cancer and your contribution to elevate well-being as a business strategic priority in your organization is inspiring. It's inspiring for me as a woman, as an HR professional. Welcome. And please share us more. Yeah, thank you, Michaela. I am so happy to be here again with you. I uh, loved our conference. I was uh, so happy to share my story. And yeah, my life has been quite a journey uh, throughout the, the years. But yeah, I got uh, breast cancer at the age of 40, which was uh, for me quite a shock to get that uh, diagnosis. And I think a lot of people who get the cancer diagnosis often goes to death that we think that, oh my God, now I'm going to die. And I did the same when I first uh, heard uh, the doctor who, um, after examining me, uh, gave me uh, the diagnosis. I was like, wow, I'm only going to be 40 years old. Like, what have I done? Have I lived my life the way I'm supposed to live it? And uh, what about the way forward? Because you, you don't know. When you go into it, you go into the unknown. So uh, for me, it was just taking one step at a time. So after I got the diagnosis, of course, I uh, received uh, treatment. And I had a lot of surgeries and uh, it's uh, weird throughout that uh, process because when you have breast cancer, obviously it affects your uh, breast and the goal for the doctors is to save your breast. So uh, normally when they remove the cancer, they replace it with a uh, prosthetic or something uh, to fill it with. But in my case, that wasn't possible because uh, the tumors were too long out and the tumors made the uh, skin kind of die. And we tried with the transplantation, but it didn't work. So I basically, I lost my breast. And in the beginning, when we talked about that uh, happening, I was like, well, it doesn't matter because the cancer is gone. So I wouldn't mind losing the breast since, uh, yeah. But for me, that was uh, really, really hard. Uh, afterwards, I felt like I lost my femininity that... Uh, 
having my breast uh, removed kind of removed a piece of me. And through the treatment, uh, in addition, I, I kind of lost myself. And I think a lot of people can relate to the fact that when we come into crisis, whether it is your health issues regarding yourself, it's if it's uh, your kids getting sick, or if it's uh, death in their family, uh, if it's a divorce, whatever it is, uh, trauma that happens to you, it kind of shifts you in a way, it changes you in a way. And uh, to adjust to that uh, change can sometimes be hard because... Uh, to live your life as normal is the easiest way, but that's not always the best way to do it. Sometimes it's necessary to make changes uh, within yourself to progress and to develop as a person. And I came from a world of well-being. Like I have worked with uh, with the uh, work environment and kind of optimizing the, the surroundings for the employees so that they were well taken care of. But when I struggle, I all of a sudden felt like I couldn't use the tools on myself. I kind of thought that I should do better. So when I started going in a, a downward spiral, both on my physical health and my mental health, I didn't use the tools that we have in the work life. I didn't use the tools that I used on others. It took me a full year after treatment with trying to find a normal ground again. Basically, I tried to go back to who I was before, but it didn't work because the cancer had changed me. Like I was a different person and I, I didn't trust my body. I didn't, I couldn't look. So I, I had this negative spiral uh, going on in my life and it wasn't good. Uh, so almost a full year after the treatment, I was in a very, very dark uh, place. It was difficult to find motivation uh, to do anything, basically. And uh, it came to a point where I thought that it would be better if I wasn't here. It was better if I wasn't here, part of this uh, world, because my physical health was I was in so much pain because of the treatment and the medicine, and also my mental health was really, really poor. And then I realized that I have to do something, like I have to change this. I cannot go about and have all these negative thoughts and, and uh, feel the way I feel. And talking to myself the way I talk to myself, which a lot of people probably can relate to, that we talk to ourselves in a negative way. And the things that I said to myself, I would never have said to a friend. So I started changing my mindset, like, okay, you need to talk to yourself a different way. You know what to do to get in a better place uh, mentally. And we know that the correlation between physical health and mental health is strong. Uh, so taking care of your physical health can benefit your uh, mental health. This I have talked about in my work life for many years. And we have started campaigns and we have done a lot of things to improve people's health. And all of a sudden I needed to use those tools on myself because I wasn't taking well uh, care of myself. So I challenged myself to go for a walk for every day for a year. So 365 days challenge. That was my goal over the next years. And I didn't put any like distance. I didn't say I'm going to go for this uh, distance or at uh, this time. I just said that go out. One step is better than none step. So when I started, I went to the mailbox. So that was my first goal. And then it was the end of the road where I lived. And I just progressed. So I went further and further and further uh, until it felt like a yeah, that I could trust my body because I didn't trust my body to, to hold me up, basically. And through that process of taking care of your physical health, the natural thing that happens is that your mental health improves. You become kind of in a lighter uh, mood. And also the time that you spend on walking is very beneficial for processing everything that uh, you've been through. So taking the time, I think a lot of women especially can relate to this. You have family, you have work, you have householding, you have a lot to take care of, right? And so taking time for ourselves is can often feel like a selfish thing, but it's it's not. Like it's the most the unselfish thing you can do is to take care of yourself and love yourself uh, because that means that you can be a better version of yourself to others. So that's basically what I uh, did. I took those stepping stones to get better, but I also asked for help. So I, I saw a therapist throughout the uh, next month to help me process the trauma that I've been through. And I think this is important when it comes to mental health that we shouldn't struggle alone. So whether you ask ask a professional or you ask a friend or you share with anyone, it's important to kind of breaking down those barriers and also get help because they can come with input that gives you valuable information that can help you improve with your journey. 
And it takes a while. So it's not a quick fix. It's not like you can go in and it changes within a few weeks. It takes months to improve. And especially with the trauma, if the trauma is deep, then it takes a good amount of time to, to improve. But I, I encourage everyone to take the time out of your busy schedule to take care of yourself so that you can improve both physically and uh, mentally. So that was the, the journey from kind of getting the breast cancer, which is traumatic in its self, but also because I didn't take well care of myself. I let it spiral down for a really long time instead of asking for help to begin with. So that's when I look back, I think that I should have asked for help to begin with instead of thinking that I could do this uh, by myself. Uh, so that was a lesson learned uh, from me. But at the same time, I learned a lot from that process, from being in a state of mind where I, because uh, when you work with HR and people, you have seen this a lot of times that people struggle. And I haven't really, like I've been supportive and all that, but I haven't really understood what they've been dealing with. But now with the experience that I have, I really understand the feeling of uh, having complete darkness when it, everything just seems impossible, where your physical health and your mental health is uh, diminished and, uh, yeah, trying to get out of it. So definitely uh, a journey that uh, I've learned a lot from, for sure. I was just reflecting, you know, to your story, Celia, and it's life changing. That's for sure. I was wondering, mm -hmm. going through this journey. Can you give us examples of changes that you did in your life as a result? Yeah, for sure. And I think this is important uh, that people understand that making changes and becoming better takes time. So being very consequent about the decision that you make, whether it doesn't matter what change you're making, a change takes approximately 66 days to make a new habit. So if you want to start something, whether it's your diet, if it's exercising or whatever it is, just remember it takes 66 days in average to change that habit before it becomes positive. And I had this in mind when I started the process because in the beginning, you're like, well, this is pointless. It doesn't make any difference. But as you go along, it becomes uh, better and your body gets used to it. And also the way you talk to yourself, because as I said, I talk very negatively to myself. And uh, I knew that I had to uh, change that and had to stop that, but I wasn't capable of doing it before I had went through this process. So I, I went through therapy, I went for walks, and then I saw a, a coach that helped me with the visualization of myself, how I looked on myself and was able to, to see myself in a different uh, perspective. And I understand that this isn't for everyone, but I have uh, a good experience of uh, making challenge for myself, like physical challenges to improve my mental capability. So pushing yourself out of the comfort zone to increase your uh, mental strength. So for me, that, uh, for example, one of the things that I uh, did was uh, to sleep outdoors in a tent alone in the forest. I've never done that before. I've been in a tent before because I used to be in the army, but never alone. So just the thought about being alone in the forest freaked me out. I was like super scared about it. But I thought that if I could overcome that, that I could build mental strength. So giving myself that challenge and sleeping through the night in the forest alone in midwinter uh, gave me a feeling of of, um, accomplishment. So when I did it, it kind of, I kind of told myself, like, trust yourself, like, you can do this. There's, yeah, there's no one stopping you. Like, in Norway, there's no bears and there's no one to fear in the forest. So all the fears that I put on myself, it's just in my head. So doing that and sleeping alone in the forest, in the cold alone, gave me a little bit more uh, resilience. And I kept on doing this. I kept on making challenges for myself. I jumped from a plane, <laughs> which I don't recommend for everyone to do. But uh, that was one of the things that I, <laughs> I know, that I uh, did to, because as I was dropping out of the plane, I thought, this is life. Like, you have no control. Like, there is no point of thinking that you control anything because you can't. So you can just hope that a parachute opens, which it did, luckily. <laughs> But that's just, for me, it was just a vision of life. Like this is, this is just a vision of life. You jump out, you have no control. Hopefully the parachute will open up and you'll be fine. Uh, so doing all the small steps to improve. And I'm not saying like you should jump out of a airplane for sure, but make something that uh, is, you see as a challenge. I had a friend who was afraid of taking elevators and she challenged herself to be able to take uh, elevators. So I helped her with that. And we went into an elevator and she was able to do it. And just those small steps build so much 
much confidence. So all of a sudden, when you do those small steps, you are like, well, I'm capable of more than I think. But we put all these fears in our heads and think that we can't do it. But I mean, women can do whatever they want, for sure. <laughs> and uh, I think everyone can if they just put their uh, minds uh, to it. So uh, for me, it's been very consistent in the, the challenge that I have given to myself going for works every day. And for that, you need discipline. It's not like I'm going to be wake up every day. I'm like, yeah, now I want to go for a walk and it can be rainy or snowing, or whatever. But I knew, I always knew that going for that walk would be beneficial for me. So I just made a cautious decision to, uh, to do it every day. And slowly it improved. Slowly, I became uh, better, stronger physically, but most important, stronger mentally, because that's where, where I struggled uh, the most. Celia, you talked at the beginning about um, the various roles we have as women and managers. Yeah? How did you manage to, to juggle all this yeah. throughout your journey and afterwards? Yeah, and I think that uh, for me, I... Um, I use a lot of visualization techniques. So uh, yeah, I should add that every morning at six o'clock, I, I woke up and I did the uh, yoga and meditation. And again, I, I don't do that uh, every day anymore, but I, I did it for a full year. And that gave me the opportunity to go through my uh, day because I've always been good with visualization. So using a technique of visualization to go through the day of who I'm going to be, where I'm going to be at, how do I uh, behave in those type of meeting? If I was going into a leadership meeting, what kind of uh, energy do I bring into that uh, meeting? And as a mom, what's my goal for today as a mother? And also lower the expectations, because if you put expectations here, you will fail. So try to lower the expectations of what you can accomplish. And as I said, taking care of yourself is beneficial and it's necessary to set up time for yourself so that you can be more present in the life of uh, others. And what I saw is that I became, um, because the year after I uh, had the cancer uh, treatment, and when I went down a uh, downward spiral, I wasn't really present anywhere. I was in my own uh, mind. I was struggling in my own mind. So whether I was in a meeting or if I was with my family, I just felt like I was there, but I wasn't really present. I wasn't really with them uh, mentally. So by doing so, by taking those few minutes in the morning to go through uh, the day and try to to see myself in the different uh, meetings and different uh, arena that I was uh, going into, I was able to improve the relations and improve my work as uh, well. But it's so hard to balance all those roles. And my only advice when it comes to uh, managing everything is, again, lower the expectation of yourself because there is no one who expects you to be super mom or super wife or yeah, super boss. It's all that is is how we created ourselves and also delegate the household if it's work there's a lot of people who can help you especially in, if you are in a vulnerable position then people are eager to help but you have to tell them you have to share your story so that they are able to uh, to help and uh, for me that became very important because as, again for the first year i didn't share anything with anyone i didn't tell anyone how i was uh, struggling but once i opened up the door for uh, showing vulnerability which is really hard by the way it's not an easy thing to do i understand that but by doing so you're allowing people around you to help to be a part of uh, your journey which is important both in work life and uh, in your family uh, life and friends because i can assure you if one of my friends said that hey i'm struggling how would be there as would anyone so by doing so by showing uh, yourself and telling everyone around you how you're doing then you're opening up for uh, other people to help as well which is a good thing it's good for me and it's good for the people around to be able to help throughout that uh, process and also i think that it's important to understand that life Life is a journey. So sometimes you will be on top, so you will be able to help others. But sometimes you are the one that's on the bottom, which is okay. And then others can help uh, you as well. So so just think, and when we talk about this in a, a work uh, situation as well, that's when people enter the organization or uh, your work, uh, when they come into the work life, it's important to help them throughout the whole process of them being a part of uh, the organization that you have. Because uh, I think that uh, we call it a uh, life circle, uh, what we call the word, taking care of them at all stages in their life. 
And as I said, life isn't like this. If it was like this, it would be really, really easy. But life goes like this, right? So we want to help everyone throughout the process of uh, the struggles that comes with life. As I said, you have small kids and it becomes a struggle. And then uh, you have teenagers and it becomes a problem. You go through a divorce, it becomes a problem. You have sick kids, it becomes a problem. And which is okay. Everyone has it like that. Uh, but it's so important that we share those stories with each other so we're able to help each other throughout that uh, process. Cecilia, I mean, for me, I mean, makes a step towards, you know, work environment. Now, if mm. I'm thinking at the stories we tell in the work mm. environment, how we work with all these support networks in the work environment, you as yeah. well-being, head of well-being mm. in your organization, yeah. with all this learning, personal learnings, Tell us more about how you build this journey of well-being. Yeah. So I I started from HSC. So I was a HSC project manager. So I had a whole risk aspect with me from uh, the beginning. And then when I, I worked as a HSC project manager in the beginning, and then I worked more into the, the work life, like uh, the health of uh, people, but more in the offices, not in the operational uh, level. And what I saw is that uh, between HSC and HR, there's a little bit of gap in a way. So there's some things that falls within HSC and some things that falls within in HR, but then there's something that falls in between. So bringing with me the risk perspective of it was really important. So when I was offered this uh, job, let me think, it's been five, four or five years. I can't remember, maybe uh, five years. I knew that I wanted to bring with me the risk perspective of it. Uh, because uh, when you do a risk assessment on work life, so if you risk assess stress, conflict, physical health, mental health, all those aspects, you are able to uh, bring actions that are very relevant for your work life because it's very specific on your either organization or a specific location. And then uh, making all those uh, actions to help improve the work life of uh, our employees. So that means from an ergonomic perspective, that can be like bringing in tables that you can raise up and down, having good chairs that is uh, good for you and all those aspects that kind of uh, makes uh, your uh, physical health uh, better. But when it comes to the mental aspect, that's much harder to work with uh, because as I said, sharing is difficult for most of us. And uh, what we say to our new employees when they come in the door, like, please tell us whatever you are struggling with, just let us know so we are able to help. Now, that's easy to say, but it's difficult when it happens. So when you are struggling, it's hard to go to your manager or uh, your HR uh, resource or someone within your organization to ask for help. But it's so important because uh, whether it's your work-life situation or it's your private situation that uh, affects you, we are here to help. Like We can help you with uh, anything and we can't solve everything but we can make things easier for you. Uh, so for me, I always thought about the process of, as I said, from risk assessment to putting through the uh, action was really important to, me to build. So, so well-being is based on that uh, um, structure that we start every year with uh, a risk assessment and then we put in the actions throughout the year and we do it on several levels. So Technique FMC is a large uh, company. We're two and a half thousand employees, more than that, 2,700 employees in Norway. And we have a lot of locations. Uh, so we have one action list that goes over Norway, like an umbrella organization. But then locally, there's uh, smaller adjustments that uh, needs to be in place. So based on how the different uh, location looks like, they will put in other actions uh, as well. And I think that's important that uh, we understand that there's not one mold that fits everyone, uh, but we can make over all structure that can benefit everyone, but then they have to make a local uh, decision to see uh, if it's per. And the one thing that we worked really hard on uh, throughout the uh, pandemic was the mental health uh, aspect. Because we saw that people uh, sitting in a home office uh, started to struggle. And to talk about that uh, was important. And also breaking down the barriers for, for asking for help. Uh, because uh, the one thing that uh, we see is people uh, wait too long to ask for help. Uh, which is unfortunate because the sooner we can uh, come in, the easier the transition uh, will uh, be. Uh, so for me, I think that I have uh, brought uh, my experience from uh, before into it. And now with personal uh, journey that I have had, I'm able to bring more to the table when it comes to employee well-being in uh, general. 
Uh, but yeah, I think a lot of people don't uh, necessarily understand what the well-being uh, concept really is. But it's not it's not very difficult. It's as I said, it's uh, taking the world of HSC and bringing it into uh, HR. And then, uh, of course, if you have everything in place, then you can start adding on. You can add on sports and social. You can add on discovery sessions. You can add on social things within the organization, Christmas parties. And there's a lot of things you can layer on top of. But the fundamental needs to be in place. If I don't know my role and responsibility and I don't uh, trust my manager, a Christmas party won't be beneficial at all. Uh, so we have to make sure that the main structure is in place and then we can add on the other stuff. And um, Sylvia, how do you ensure this fair balance between hmm. performance results, uh, which in Romanian business culture tend to come first, and well-being yeah. and Doing so, how do we elevate well-being among business priorities? Yeah, I think that uh, it's really important to understand that you can't do business without people. So taking care of your people should be your priority number one, and the rest will follow. For me, it's that easy, that if we take care of our people, they will perform. They're educated, they have experience, they know what to do. But if we don't take care of them, they are not uh, uh, as productive as they uh, should be. So we have a structure in Norway that... Um, and make sure that we enroll the employees' uh, representatives, which is very beneficial because then we can hear what's going on in the organization so we can make the best uh, decision. So we have this meeting quarterly. So every uh, three months we meet and discuss with the unions and the safety delegates, employee representatives to understand what's going on in the uh, organization so we can make adjustments uh, if uh, needed. And I think uh, that uh, having this type of resource, having a well-being responsible or someone from HR focusing on this uh, topic is very beneficial for, for the business. Because as I said, if you don't take care of the people, the people will not take care of the organization. So if you have trust in the organization, then they will perform much better. Because if I like you, I will perform much better. So building that trust and building that relationship and uh, doing so by, as I said, focusing on the people and the people relationship, and also, again, breaking down the barriers for the things that affect us. And it's just taking your normal life into your work life and think that, okay, how would I how would I have treated my uh, friends when they came to this? I, I would have given them care and uh, uh, making sure that, uh, and sometimes it's just a conversation, having that conversation with your employees and be like, how are you doing? Are we really doing? And then they will share and that will be enough. Maybe you don't have to do anything other than just listening to uh, what's going on. And in that uh, way, you, you build trust between uh, two human beings and uh, trust obviously increase uh, productivity because then I will perform better because I uh, I trust you. Yeah. And just building on, you know, on what you just said, you are one in an organization of 2,700 employees. So how <laughs> did you manage to make this not Celia's role or the role of the well-being head, but the role of leadership? Right. So what we have done is uh, we have built a network in uh, Norway that uh, is, uh, we call it a site management uh, network. And that again, if you come from a hierarchy structure, it's very different of a uh, way of uh, thinking. But from a work environment perspective, you kind of have to think uh, different because uh, again, it doesn't normally uh, affect the structure, but it affects the umbrella organization. So how do we take care of our employees? So building a network with one site manager on each uh, location and bringing in HSC, bringing in HR, uh, me as uh, well-being, communication is super important when it comes to well-being because that's the way we reach our employees and get the information uh, shared and also having the risk element uh, as a part of it. So we, again, we meet uh, quarterly and discuss only work environment. So that's our main focus. And this is unusual for managers uh, to have such a meeting where they only discuss a work environment. But again, we see the benefits of uh, doing so. And we've seen it uh, throughout the service that we have done ever since we started working like this, that uh, they gradually improve. And building a structure like this takes time. So it's no quick fix. Again, building trust in the organization, good communication takes time. And then we had a pandemic, which made it difficult. In a normal structure, it's uh, really important to set focus on uh, on work environment and only work environment. Because if you bring in business uh, to it, it's so easy that we talk about uh, those aspects instead of uh, talking about the people.
like just seeing the people and understanding the people and how can we improve their uh, general well-being. And Celia, the $100 question, what do you measure? What are those essential KPIs that you are reviewing with business yeah. on well-being? Yeah, so for us, it's uh, been really important to, because uh, 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 well-being is hard to measure. The one thing that we measure it by is the sick leave statistics seeing how many people we have on the sick leave at any time. So we monitor them quarterly to see if there is any improvements that we need to do. And understanding the sick leave. The sick leave is uh, work-related or it's a general flu. That could be the case uh, as well. And then we have employee service that we uh, do. Now, before we did a service every year or, or every second year, and they, those usually were big and took a lot of time. And you know, when you have done a big survey and you put in action, the time flies by. So things changes within the organization as you have done the survey. So now we have uh, gone from taking it yearly to go over to taking it uh, quarterly. So we do one small survey instead of a big one, uh, which take less time and also it's easier to work on the actions afterwards. So this has been very beneficial for us. Uh, uh, so we can focus on one thing and making good actions on those. And then we repeat. After a year, we do the same thing and we uh, repeat it. And then we can take the topics. Like for now, we had bullying and harassment and sexual harassment as a topic, uh, which is really important to ask our organization uh, about. And the next thing will be inclusion and diversity. And then we'll go on to flexible work, which we have home office. So there's elements of the uh, work environment that we want to, uh, to understand. But the one thing that we prioritize in each survey is the one-to-one -one conversation that a manager has with their employees. So the one question that is really important to ask, do you have regular one-to-one -one with your employees or do you have regular one-to-one -one with your manager? Because having that uh, type of relationship and that conversation with your uh, manager drives engagement. This we know. We know that uh, having a good relationship with your manager drives engagement. And we have something that's called uh, check-ins. Uh, so combined with the one-to-one -one and the check-ins, the check-ins is more about the, the structure of your work life. Do you need support? Do you need more education? Do you need more training? Making sure that the framework of your work life is in place. So we do this quarterly, but the one-to-ones we do regularly on maybe every second week to make sure that the employees are well taken care of and also can give feedback to us. So we understand that if we need to make any uh, adjustments. But in general, checking out the work environment, as I said, in the surveys, also talking to the employee representatives is a way of uh, kind of getting a feeling of what's going on in uh, the organization. And the sick leave, of course, is uh, super important because if the sick leave increases, there's definitely a feedback to the organization that something is uh, going on. Celia, thank you so much for everything you've shared. I'm taking a lot of lessons for me personally and as an HR leader. I wanted to ask you for a nice closing. If we are to summarize, what would be the golden rule for well-being at work in an organizational context? Yeah, I think the first uh, step that is really important is making sure that you take care of yourself, making sure that you are a priority when it comes to your own life. And that means that you have to set up time to take care of yourself. So whether if you go for walks or take a nice cup of tea, hang out with friends, whatever gives you energy, make sure that you set up time to do so. Uh, because the life is so busy. And as we talked about the demands from everyone within the organization with your partner or it's your kids and the household and that activities. There's so many things that requires your attention, which is good, but you also need to take time to take care of uh, yourself. So setting off those minutes during a week, and if you start with as I said, I started with walking to the mailbox and then I worked further and further and just trying to prioritize uh, yourself uh, within the week. Just start somewhere. If it's 30 minutes a week, then that's the start. And then you can progress as you go along. And then when it comes to us as professionals within the organization, really listen and understand the people. There's no one more important than our people. So always people first, then business. Because if you take care of the people, then the business will solve itself. And as HR professionals, it's our responsibility to set that focus and be a good role model for our employees so that they can benefit uh, from that as we go along. And changing a culture of openness, building trust, all that stuff, it takes time. So it's not uh, done by a month or so. It takes years to change a culture of openness and sharing and showing each other vulnerability and talking about physical health, talking about mental health, because it all affects us when it comes to work life. If you're not doing 
well at home, I can assure you that that will affect your uh, work as well. But if you can then share a little bit with your people around you, then they are able to help you to get through that. Because life goes like this, as we talked about. And I think it's important to help each other throughout the process. But that also it means that you uh, have to share yourself. So that's uh, one advice that I will give, especially to HR professionals, to help uh, breaking down those barriers. Don't be afraid to show vulnerability. I think that vulnerability is a superpower. And I'm not to say that you need to share everything, but enough so that people can understand and help you throughout that process. Thank you so much. And look, if I may just last ask, as I'm a big fan and a follower on social media, you yeah. <laughs> said that uh, us, especially women, we can do whatever we want to do. Yes. I know you have big plans. Yeah, for yeah, the yeah. future, you can share with us. Yeah, so throughout the, the cancer treatment, I had the benefit of having the latest uh, research. So my treatment uh, was really, really good because the research that had been done the years before had helped uh, improve the treatment. So for me, it became really important to give back. So making sure that I was able to help research and also help setting focus on uh, breast cancer. So I started this uh, project, uh, which is fundraising expedition over Greenland, uh, the ice cap of uh, Greenland. And it's really crazy to think about that when I started this process, again, I walked to the mailbox and in May, I'm going to cross the ice cap of Greenland, which is 600 uh, kilometers. And then we're going to be on the ice cap for 28 days. So it's going to be me together with three other breast cancer survivors. It's Liv Arneson, which is uh, the first woman who uh, went to the South uh, Pole unsupported and then two female uh, guys. So it's a really like strong woman uh, team that uh, is going to cross the ice cap and uh, to Together, we are able to set focus on breast cancer, but also the importance of physical and mental health. And then, of course, we're going to fund for breast cancer research so that others can benefit from that in the future. Because every year it uh, progress. Every year the treatment gets better and the more women can survive. There are 685,000 deaths every year to breast cancer. And if we can save one of those, then it's all worth it. So I think that there are no dreams that are too big and there are are no goals that is too big either. I think that, as I said, women can do whatever they want. It's just uh, putting your uh, mind into it and putting the work into it because it takes takes some workout hours to be able to cross the ice cap. But I think that, again, if you have your mind set on it, then anything is possible. Just have to take the steps. But remember, the mailbox might be the first goal. <laughs> We've reached the end of today's episode, yet we are left craving more valuable lessons like Celia's. Many thanks to both of you once again, to you, Misha, for your questions and input, and to our listeners, thank you for your tuning. Till next time. Bye-bye. Very yes. grateful for this conversation today, Siri. I'm looking forward to read about your stories after Greenland, yeah? Thank you. Thank you. HR Club Talks. Powered by WISROM.